on this episode of Still Loading, this audio comes at a premium. Everyone and welcome to this new episode of the Still Loading Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Koval, and today on the show, I have a wonderful guest lined up for you. We are going to be chatting about uh, their history in the games industry in general, but also seeing where the conversation will take us. It's a little bit more of a loosey-goosey episode, one that I'm, uh, I, don't, I don't do too often, uh, but we're going to see where this goes. Joining me today is uh, Barry Carenza, who is the host of the Nintendo Fuse podcast. He works at the website Nintendo Fuse. He also is one of the founders of Premium Edition Games, who uh, is a game publisher. So, Barry, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for being on the show. I'm looking forward to chatting with you. Um, so first off, since like I told the listeners at the top, it's a little more loosey-goosey. So we're going to start off with a loosey-goosey question. What you been playing? Huh, that's great. So uh, I just started Sonic Superstars today. Uh, having mm. fun with it. It's, uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's just a quicker playthrough, but it's, it's almost like a palate cleanse because I just did Super Mario Wonder and uh, 100% of that. And I did Spider-Man 2 and finished that. Did not 100%, but had a blast. And, uh, you know, now I'm, I'm just awaiting Star Ocean 2. The remake is coming out later this week. And WarioWare is coming out later this week. This year has been a really good year for games. <laughs> it's been a, a lot of great oh games have come out. This year has to be my favorite in a long time. It's just been nonstop. And I don't think I've really played any of them. <laughs> I don't have the time, unfortunately, or uh, the or the funds to to keep up with it all. There's just too much good stuff coming out. I really wanted to pick up Mario Wonder because I'm a huge Mario fan, but that and like who doesn't want to play as elephant mario like it just looks so fucking cool but i <laughs> i i couldn't justify the the 60 or 70 bucks or whatever nintendo is charging for it now um for myself though i've been what i have been able to play is i've been playing um actually recently for the podcast i've been playing final fantasy 7 crisis core but on the psp not the remake the original psp title um working my way through that because it's a patron poll and then uh i also have been for kind of like the game that i you know my comfort game right now i feel like i don't know do, do you have a comfort game that just kind of shifts like when you're not playing anything else there's just a game you always go back to is there only one or do you kind of shift around from like game to game as your comfort game um i play final fantasy 14 so you know, I'll, I'll be like, all right, I'll go do some more stuff there uh, in between other games. Uh, I also, uh, I love Theater Rhythm and Final Bar Line came out earlier this year. So lately I've been like, oh, you know, I've got, you know, 10 minutes. I'll go play a couple songs and try and collect some cards. Uh, those are probably my main two other than uh, I do Mario Kart Tour on the phone still. So, you know, I'll be like, oh, I got 10, 15 minutes. I'll do that. So I've been hearing a whole bunch of Final Fantasy talk. I'm assuming you're a big Final Fantasy fan, then. Absolutely. I'm going to have to consider you for my. I don't know if you. I don't know if you got got a chance to listen to any of my episodes, but I did an episode earlier this year called the Final Fantasy Fantasy Draft, where it's kind of like uh, what happens when you mix fantasy sports with Final Fantasy. Um, it's 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 a it's like a two and a half hour long. It's it's just wild. You just have to listen to it. Um, uh, it's it's basically you know everyone's out. drafting. It's it's a lot of fun. It's where you know every I have a couple guests on and they draft their quote unquote ideal Final Fantasy. So you know, um, if just for example, if someone drafts Cloud as one of their party members, no one else can have Cloud at all in their draft, party member or otherwise. So it's works just like a sports draft but obviously with final fantasy aspects so and i won't rehash the whole thing listeners have heard it before there's actually two of them there's one that came out this year and one from march of last year i want to say uh but yeah i'm going to start doing them annually so i'll have to i i have not 
come up with a slate of guests for 2024s. But anyway, um, the reason I brought up comfort games in the first place and, you know, asking you about yours, my current one is Company of Heroes. Have you ever heard of that? Of course I've heard of it. Haven't played it, but I've heard of it. I mean, I, I'm surprised. Not a lot of people know Company of Heroes just because if you're not into RTSs, you know, not everyone really looks out for it. But I adore that game. I'm awful at it. I'm not good at RTSs, but it's it's still a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, what I wanted to ask next was: you are the host of the Nintendo Fuse podcast, and you work at the what? Or you are part of the website Nintendo Fuse. So I kind of want to know just how did you get your start there? Yeah, so I'm I'm one of the hosts. I'm I'm uh, we have three three co-hosts total. Uh, so yeah, I got started there over a decade ago. I was just on Twitter. And just looking through one night and one of the people who I followed was like, oh, yeah, we're, we're doing another episode for Nintendo Fuse. And we did they, did, they would always go live and be like, oh, you know, listen live and, and call in and be a part of the show. And I was like, oh, that sounds interesting. So I listened, you know, I was listening in. I called in. I got in the air. I got, you know, got in the episode that way. And afterwards, I sent him a message. I said, that was a lot of fun. You know, I really like that. You know, so I don't know if you're you're looking for more hosts or anything because, you know, I really like that. And they said, well, right now we're not, but we're, we're always looking for reviewers and stuff for the website. So I said, yeah. So I joined the website and did reviews and press and news and stuff. And then I, I came on periodically on the podcast. And, you know, a few episodes later, they're like, you know what? You know, you've been so good. Like, let's, do, you know, just come on. I was like, okay. And I think I've only missed two episodes in 10 years that we've done oh, it. Wow. We, we've, we, we used to do it like periodically, like and then it was like once a month. And then, you know, we actually got down to like once a week. And, and right now it's every other week. We do it uh, 8.30 p.m. on Mondays. So, you know, this is an off week as we're recording this. We do it 8.30 p.m. Eastern uh, live on YouTube and Twitch. Uh, on camera, the whole nine yards is, mm-hmm. and then, you know, the, the audio versions edited out, but the three of us, you know, Steve and Greg are my other co-hosts. They're amazing guys and amazing friends. And uh, we just have fun. We cover Nintendo news every, you know, every other week and, you know, what we've been playing and what's coming up and, you know, any headlines. And we just have discussions about it and we allow people to, who are watching live to chat in and we read their comments on, on the air and they become like a fourth person. And then, you know, afterwards, you know, if you listen afterwards, leave comments and we'll reply and uh, we just have a good time. So we've been doing it. I've been part of it. The, the, I think they've been doing it for like 15 years total, uh, 12 or 15 oh, wow. years. And I've been doing it, you know, just uh, just over a decade with them. But uh, it's it's been a blast. That's why I, I am on the website now. I didn't realize they started back um, as in the in like early 2006 under a different name. We ten yeah, we Nintendo we, as it was. But mm mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that's, so that's crazy. I can't, time. I mean, I can't even imagine doing it. That's, that's awesome. Um, so with be covering only Nintendo news that I'm assuming is Nintendo, your current, like if out of the big three up there, Nintendo is your go-to I'm assuming. Uh, I play on all of them. Uh, I own them all. Uh, I don't, I don't fuel console wars because I think they're silly, but, Agreed. Uh, I, I do like of all the of the three big first parties, Nintendo holds the closest spot to my heart because of my, you know growing up, and I love the characters. So in, in that regards, yes. But I play so many third party and first party from other games. You know, like I mentioned, I just played Spider Man Two. Uh, you know, I, I will absolutely not hold myself to just Nintendo titles. I enjoy games on all systems uh, and just games across the board because it's a well, great industry. Oh, I meant more or less. Like, do you do you grab like is when I say gravitate, I don't mean only play that, but I mean like, do you have like like for example, I don't consider myself this now, but I was more of I was a Sony fan probably. I would think that was my favorite ecosystem. Now I would actually say it's more Nintendo. Like, I'm not saying you know they don't no other console holds good options. I love the exclusives on on PlayStation. I haven't really touched my Xbox in a while, though. I, I was playing Ori in the Blind Forest uh, somewhat recently, but um, yeah. yeah. So I, like, it was more or less like it was Diablo Four. Man, I haven't even I didn't even, I haven't even touched Diablo. I don't think I even got that game yet. Is it any good? 
I enjoyed it, but I hate that it's always online, even if you're single player. Like, I get why they did that, yeah. but I'd like to be able to play single player games without an internet connection and without paying a subscription fee. Yeah, I. Oh, so you need to have Xbox Live to mm-hmm. play Diablo single? That is the dumbest. Or or, or PS Plus, and that's probably the re- that's actually the reason I played on Xbox is because I still have Xbox Live from the Xbox days. It still like recurs and like I was like, all right, you know, like since I have that, I don't have PS Plus because I don't play a lot of online stuff. I'm like, I'll do the Xbox version because I already have Xbox Live. That's wild. That is the dumbest thing I think I've heard. Like, all right, I, I'm going to have to hold in a rant on that. That's like a good mini episode for me to rant about <laughs> for the Patreon. Um, well, Diablo so, 3 was like that too, except for the Switch version. The Switch really? version does not need online for single player because of the portability. and you Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to play it if you were just walking out in the street. So the PS4 version and the PC version, because they did the whole auction house and Diablo 3, um, you need an online connection to play single player. But the Switch version, which does have the DLC and the expansion and all that, you can play You can play it online still, but you can also play it single player without any internet. It's just, I, The always online thing is one of my biggest pet peeves of, of modern gaming. Like, I don't mind having everything be connected, but the necessity of it having to be connected... I will never, it'll never sit right with me. It just never does. I agree. 100%. And that, that kind of leads me then to the, like, not really the second half, but like the, the second half of your, of your job, of your, of your, of like what you kind of do in the games industry is you are one of the founders of premium edition games, which um, is, uh, you say, uh, like a, it's a publisher that does small runs of, I, I, I don't actually, how, how, small or is it like small runs of games or is it do you just publish on demand like how exactly does that work we we do so yeah i'm a founding member with a bunch of others um we got together to make uh we we do physical publishing of digital only titles and Mm -hmm. we are not limited in that regards like we will we do open pre-orders so we want to make sure that we print enough for for the initial demand and we print extra because there's always people that miss out on pre-orders or don't hear about us until after a pre-order is ended and we do a lot of conventions so we were at conventions and we sell games we want to make sure we have copies of uh of games available but you know we do have special editions like retro editions and deluxe editions that are limited those are more for collectors but uh yeah we 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 will print as many as needed, um, you know, to to meet the demand, and they're all official. You know, it's official through Nintendo, through Sony. Uh, they are ESRB rated. You know, part of the the official library. Now, listeners, believe it or not, this is this uh, Barry did not come on the podcast just to promote uh, premium edition stuff. Uh, he we actually reached out just to kind of hang out on mic, shoot the shit for a little bit, mm-hmm. and see where our conversation goes, but. I, the reason I wanted to ask about it is, A, I'm not, as I mentioned off mic, I, I don't know, like, I always, I always feel like I need to have some type of focus of my show. So instead of just kind of random banter, but the other half of that, though, I was, I'm genuinely curious about a lot of the stuff that goes into, uh, like, what you do at Premium Edition Games, because ever since... I won't name the competitor, the competitor, which must not be named just for, just to keep in line with that. But like um, ever since they kind of grew in popularity, there's been a lot of of uh, you guys popping up. And I'm always curious about like the ins and outs of it because I feel like it's it's such an interesting business model to take digital only games and make them and make give give the devs who work so hard on their game a, a physical release something that they can see in their hands which i think personally i think is really cool um so i wanted to ask like what do you like what kind of things do you look for in a game when deciding to publish it is it is it sales numbers is it a specific genre is there any type of like uh like criteria you don't have to give away the criteria i'm sure that's proprietary but is there like some type of criteria they have to meet No, it's absolutely none of that. We don't look at sales numbers. We don't look at um, any of that because we don't care. What we care about is games that are fun, games that are, you know, excite us, games that we really enjoy. So we, uh, 
we will test every game we put out and we'll, the team will play it and vote on it and sometimes we have games that we love but we you know we we know we're tougher sales so we have to pass unfortunately either they're too quick you know they, they, they may not have a long longevity or or stuff like that or they're just tough genres i mean there's there's certain genres that just do not uh garner as much attention as others and uh that's unfortunate because there's some great games uh, that a lot of people have unfortunately never heard of. And then there's others that we say, yeah, let's let's talk about it. Let's try and do it. And uh, as long as the team loves it, we put out usually between six and eight games a year. So we're, mm. you know, we, we go slowly. And what we want to do is we want to highlight those games and highlight the developers behind the games and give them the attention. And we don't want to just flood, here's game, 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 because that's the problem with a lot of it with the eShop, right? There's, if you go to eShop any single week, every week, there's, you know, 10 to 15 to 20 games every week. And so many of these games, they sync. If, unless it mm. gets featured, they sync. You don't hear about it. You don't realize they're out. Yep. And they, there's so many things. You go to the eShop, um, you, what do you usually pick? Like the featured. Let's see what's featured. Let's see what's out there. Um, you probably will never know to search for this particular game. So we, uh, we give them kind of a second life. And we want to give them the attention. So we highlight them. We advertise them. We show them off. You know, we, we want the developers to get that attention that they deserve. So, you know, we, we look at it as a more tightly knit family. So, you know, any any game that comes under our umbrella, you know, is part of the family. And, and we, we're we really proud of them. And hopefully they're proud of, of us and what we do. And, and, you know, it's always great when the developers get a hold, you know, they get their copies of uh, their game when, when they're, you know, assembled and, and manufactured. And they, you know, they said, oh, I got it in the mail and it, it exceeded my expectations. And that's what we shoot for at premium. We want to exceed everyone's expectation in terms of our packaging, in terms of the quality, in terms of what we, you know, bring in, because that's what we do. You know, we're not the rock stars. The real rock stars are the developers and the digital publishers who, who find these games first and mm -hmm. get them out there. And then we just put a pretty bow on it. But we want to put the prettiest bow possible so that everyone loves it and uh we try and do you know get the game complete on cart or disc and, and preserve it physically because game preservation is important to us and uh but the real rock stars are the developers themselves and that we work with some f absolutely fantastic developers and it's a true honor for the one thing you you mentioned earlier on, I it just made me think: what's a, what's you don't have to list them all, but like what's a genre of games that just in general you find has been a hard sell before, like that you wouldn't like you don't you don't have to name any specific games. I don't want you to shout it because no, no, I mean hard like, oh yeah, but like, well, you mentioned real time strategy, right? Real time strategy is not yeah. a not a very widely even known, of uh, you know kind of genre uh in the 90s i mean we had warcraft starcraft and and like campaign and conquer um but those have kind of gone away i mean more people now know warcraft because of wow than they do for warcraft one two or three like their actual real-time strategy roots uh so i feel like that for example is a and i love rts i grew up with warcraft and starcraft and it's just one of those where it's like okay like that is a tougher like the average joe probably isn't interested and it sucks because no, you're right as much game. as it as much as it pains me to agree <laughs> you're probably right you know same with like point and click i love point and click you know i grew up with the lucas you know film uh, adventure series you know like uh, monkey island and day of the tentacle and and maniac mansion and sam and max uh so great great games and, you know, and we even had like a kind of resurgence a little bit with like Thimbleweed Park recently. Or more, I say that it was like 2017 it came out, or 20. Um, but uh, you know, it's it's uh, still the average Joe is going to be like oh, bored. I mean, Telltale did did well for a little bit, and even they went under, um, and they had mm -hmm. big big IPs. So it's it's kind of like looking at that stuff, and it's like. 
you know, it sucks. But that's not to say we won't do those games because we absolutely will. Um, when we, you know, if you find one that we really absolutely speaks to us versus something like a platformer or an RPG or an action RPG or, you know, first person shooter or stuff like that. Those are usually genres that sell more just in the grand scheme. They're more popular, more people know about them. They're also better on home consoles. Like RTS games are a little bit rougher on home. Like Switch, I think, has some deep because of the touchscreen that you can kind of make it work. But in general, it's a lot harder, I feel like, in control scheme wise on a home console. But uh, it's interesting. You said like I, you're. I agree with you. RTS is still is a still a pretty niche genre. You know, we're not in the '90s anymore. However, I will say, Age of Empires two has been making a resurgence on Twitch. Uh, uh, in the past couple of years or so, there's a streamer named T90 who he had this tournament called the Hidden Cup tournament. Which I I, I don't know. Have you ever heard of T90 or the Hidden Cup tournament? No, I have not. Uh, he's coming back to Twitch. He was on Facebook gaming for two years, but he's coming back to Twitch in November, um, which by the time this comes out will be a month past, but uh, <laughs> it, uh, he's coming back to Twitch in November. And um, he did this thing called the hidden cup tournament where what it was, he would get eight of the top ranked age of empires, competitive players, age of empires Two definitive edition is what they use um, age of empires, two players. And then he'd have, uh, there, there'd be eight invites and then there would be eight play-ins. So other, you know, professional players or like players who play competitively can compete in some like basically uh, buy-in rounds type of thing. And he will, or I shouldn't say buy-in, but compete to like play-in rounds. That's the word I'm looking for. And they can then, whoever's the, the, the top eight of those play-ins will then get to participate in the Hidden Cup. And the reason it's called the Hidden Cup is because all eight or 16 of those players, you don't know who is who. Like they give them all aliases and different, mo- it's, you know, like Joan of Arc, like all based off history stuff since it's Age of Empires. So no one knows who each other is. None of the players know who each other are. The, uh, the, the broadcasters who are streaming it don't know who the who the players are. The most you can do is look at the players' uh, strategies. Like they'll analyze all the players' strategies, and when they show up in games, like oh, you know, like Hera likes to do this, this, and this a lot. You know, like eighty percent of the time. So this is a high percent chance that it could be Hera playing this, or the Viper is doing this, or something along those lines. So it's a complete mystery until the entire cup goes runs its course. You know, all sixteen competitors. Go, go in get knocked out and it's a massive like three or four day event where they they commentate for like i want to say oh like it's it starts at like noon and ends at like 8 p.m or something like that or maybe even like 10 a.m goes to 8 p.m like it's a long day it's like eight to ten hours um and you they'll play through all the matches you know they'll play through all of the first round matches i want to say over like the first like day and a half and then the second round and third round match is going to take place and on the second day and then the fourth day it, it's hard to explain it's it might be four days actually but it's a long event and he hasn't had one in in a couple of years because he switched over to facebook gaming and his numbers dropped but he was pulling in i want to say like well like over a hundred thousand people on one of the hidden cup tournaments like it's been getting some numbers which is surprising still doesn't mean rts is back as a genre but it's kind of cool to see that long-winded tangent brings me all the way around to say it's kind of cool to see rts kind of getting a little bit of a resurgence you know hey that's great i mean this i think all genres do that they kind of go through little bits of resurgence you know and it's it's great to to see that you know, I'd love to see the because I don't, I don't necessarily say the community ever dies because it's it's more niche, but it's nice to see more people take notice and and kind of go out of their comfort zone because you know I think growing up in the '80s, you know, genres were being invented, <laughs> so it was like, <laughs> oh, there's no game like this, let's try this. Where you know, kids today. They've got 40 years worth of gaming in the past. So if they play a game, let's say they play Legend of Zelda and they really like it. Well, they don't have to wait a year or two for the next Zelda game. They've got 
decades upon decades worth of Zelda games they could bounce to. And then when they if they play all the Zelda games and still want more and there's not a new Zelda out, they could play the decades upon decades of Zelda like games or Zelda clones and there's a ton of them. So they can stay mm-hmm. with one genre almost for their entire life. So I'm not saying that people don't branch out, but there's less of a reason to try games outside of genres you really like because there's so many games in each genre at this point that's very true that's very true what do you think is something that like because this isn't I, uh, this is this could trend into like an ageist like territory and i, I never want to be that old man that yells at cloud type of thing but what do you <laughs> think is one of the biggest benefits of modern gaming for people growing up now and then conversely what's someone that one of the biggest uh like drawbacks that's the word i'm looking for one of the biggest drawbacks so benefits and drawbacks i'd say one of the biggest benefits is just having games and (laughs) you know having having the option the the options upon options and and, uh, upon options um and i think one of the drawbacks is too many options choice, uh, choice paralysis choice. as they call yeah. it yeah yeah it's like oh I, I don't know what to choose um that and i think there are a group of people who will play a modern game and then they get hypercritical about anything that doesn't look as good oh i don't want to play an 8-bit game because it doesn't have hyper realistic graphics it's not in 3d and they're why is there out. not ray tracing on your nintendo yeah. game yeah, and they're missing out on classic. And then they get hypercritical of modern games where it's like, oh, well, this game looks better than that game, so that game instantly sucks because it doesn't look as good. Well, you don't even play it yet. <laughs> like, play it. Mm-hmm. Graphics aren't everything. You know, and I think that's something you learn as you get older is gameplay is more important than graphics. I'm not saying graphics don't enhance a game, but oh, I would yeah. rather play an ugly game that plays well and is fun than a beautiful game that I'm bored to tears and plays a crap. <laughs> 100%. I'm with you on that. And it, it's frustrating because I feel like part of the beauty of the modern era is all the content that surrounds games like outside of the game itself. And the reason I, I bring that up is because you you were talking about graphics and how people's obsession with fidelity can be a hindrance. And there's a YouTube channel, um, oh my gosh, Digital Foundry, and they do amazing stuff. Have you ever seen their, have you ever watched their stuff? Yeah, yeah, they do. It's a lot of great stuff. Yeah, I I love what they do in terms of the tech specs, but I feel, and this is not their fault, just to be clear, but it, I feel like a side effect of doing that, of really analyzing the visual and tech breakdowns of every single game it's kind of cultivated that culture you were talking about before of being so hypercritical of the visuals you know yeah well it's like if you walk into a best buy like right now and you go to the tv section you're going to see a wall of tvs you can walk into a walmart or target or whatever you're going to see the same thing and you if you're looking to buy a tv and price isn't an issue it's going to be a lot harder for you to buy because you're going to look at all the TVs and go, well, this one's slightly sharper and this one's slightly brighter and this one has a little more rich color. And you're comparing Mm -hmm. them all when in reality, no matter which one you buy and you take home, it's going to look fantastic because you're not comparing it immediately to others right next to it. You're only looking at that one TV. And yeah, if you buy the one that has slightly less bright colors than the other one that has slightly brighter colors, you're not going to pay attention to that when you're watching your favorite show or movie or playing your favorite game because the colors are going to look great. And I feel a lot of people when it's like, oh, which system do I buy this for? We'll, we'll look at things like Digital Foundry. And if you look like, say, the Switch and the PlayStation 5 and like, oh, look, the Switch one loads like a, a, like. 0.2 seconds slower uh, uh, and you know and maybe the graphics aren't as sharp as the ps5 and you're seeing them side by side you go oh yeah well the ps5 is going to be the better one but if you just buy the switch version and play it you're not going to notice that you're not going to care mm-hmm. because you're not comparing it in real time to another version and maybe you might notice the loading time but if it's that minute it's not going to be that big of a deal 
And if it was that big of a deal, then you're just buy the PlayStation version or the PS5 version. And that's where I feel like it. you really, really what should be the deciding factor for the person is just like what, in all honesty, like as long as it runs, you know, which you can look at Digital Foundry and see like, is there like major frame rate issues? I'm not talking about a couple frame drops. I mean, like unplayable frame rate issues. Uh, you could look at stuff like that. But if it doesn't, as long as it doesn't have that form factor, like what do you, how how do you want to experience the game? Do you want to experience it for the handheld experience? Then you want to probably get it for Switch if it's available. If you don't care about that, if you like the home experience, then what controller do you feel most comfortable with? I personally always have preferred the PlayStation stuff, but that's just my personal preference. Like if you like Xbox because of the online things and get it for Xbox, like, like, I don't know. To me, like I pick a system based off just whatever my interest is in that, during that point in my life. And then that's what I buy it for. Like, I don't, there's no need for this unnecessary tech comparisons. As long as it can run on the system, that's it. That should be the end all be all. But it is weird to me that there is so much nitpicking with that. And it, it ties into, unfortunately. And once again, no, this is not me throwing shade at Digital Foundry because I, I like what they do. But it, it lends into the thing that we uh, you brought up before the console war bullshit where people just feel this bizarre loyalty to a giant corporation that doesn't even know they exist see the console war thing is always funny because console war started back with the atari and television and it started you know as marketing it was literally marketing going against each other um trying to say their product is better uh and then of course you know, the 8-bit, you know, really Sega and Nintendo didn't go after each other, but it was the 16-bit that really ramped it up in terms of commercials and advertisements with Sega going after Nintendo, Nintendo going after Sega, Atari going after both of them. Uh, you know, it, it was quite interesting to look back on and see. And of course, you know, post the 16-bit, there was, you know, Sony and 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 Sega and Nintendo definitely got into it. I mean, the Crash Bandicoot commercials with the guy in the, the Crash <laughs> yep. the megaphone yelling at uh, at Nintendo corp headquarters outside while Nintendo sends a VHS of a Sony and a, a, a Sega rep, you know, kidnapping a Nintendo rep and tying him up to tell the secrets about the Rumble Pack and Star Fox 64. I mean, the mm -hmm. whole thing, looking back on it, is funny because it's marketing. And I think if you're a kid, you know, as kids, you don't have a lot of money. You don't, you know, you get what you get at, at Christmas. You And if your parents got you a Sega Genesis or, or a Master System, you had to champion it because you wanted to feel like you had the superior, like, y'all, you weren't missing out and versus the kid who had the, the NES or the Super Nintendo. Uh, and then that poor kid with the Jaguar and the, and the Lynx is like, oh, me, yay. Um, but it's, it's just <laughs> funny because... As you go, grow up and you grow older, you have more income and you could buy all the systems. You realize just how foolish it is. You know, it's it's really that's that it's not championing for a company that doesn't because a company doesn't give a shit about you. It's it's exactly. pretty much reassuring yourself that I made the right decision buying this particular console or this game for this console, and I'm not missing out on the best experience that other people are having. And in reality, you should stop caring about what other people are doing and just enjoy what you have and enjoy playing the games, you know. And I think social media has hindered that because that's all anyone wants to do is we want to come on and either they'll praise a game. And if someone's praising a game, someone always has to put in the comments, oh, this game sucks. You have terrible taste. Oh, God, grow up. Uh, or, or if you hate a game and you post, you have to post, I have to hate the game. And then people say, oh, you're crazy. I love the game. But it's like no one cares. Just love what you love, hate what you hate, but just enjoy. Like life is so short. <laughs> the Sony, and there's no Sega, need to like... Nintendo, Microsoft, no one gives a shit. Like they don't care. <laughs> And there's no need to shit on someone for their own personal preferences. Like there's absolutely, like, it makes no sense. Like let's not, let people like what they like. There's no, there's no reason to, I don't know. I, I have no issue with people bringing like criticism to games, you know, like I, that's what I, you know, I talk about it on my podcast, you know, like I'll do deep, when I do deep dives, I'll talk about the aspects of a game that I like and that I dislike. It's funny. I was actually listening to uh, one of my, good podcasting friends retro hangover they did they recently released a three and a half hour episode on the original dark souls and 
I am famous for not liking that game in the slightest. Uh, I I have various reasons for it. I'm not going to rehash it here, but I loved listening to it because when they offered praise for it, it wasn't just like the whole get good moniker that you always see with Dark Souls fan and Soulsborne fans and shit like that. But they had very thoughtful analysis where you know they're talking about what they like they also had thoughtful analysis of what they didn't like and i i much rather have that approach like and, and at the very least if you if you listen to it and you still don't agree with it and you still don't like the game then at the, that point you're just like all right well it's not for me but i'm glad it speaks to you i'm glad it does something for you it's a weird thing where people will now shit on stuff just for the sake of shitting on something like they they need to be correct with their opinion as opposed to just letting people like what they like. Sorry, I didn't mean to go on a soapbox no, with you're, this. No, <laughs> you're 100% right. You know, people people like to justify their opinions, and they don't have to justify their opinions because they're, they're opinions. If if I like a game, I like a game. It could be the most hated game in the world. It could get 1.0, but if I like it, I like it. Maybe it's a guilty pleasure, but I still like it. And if you like it, then you like it. Who cares what other people say? If you're playing a game going, boy, I hope everybody likes this game. Otherwise, I shouldn't like this game. Then you probably should be seeking help because you should be <laughs> enjoying what you enjoy. And if you if you say, hey, I only like to play Call of Duty. That's all I play. I love Call of Duty. I like first person shooters. That's it. I don't want to talk about we're talking about genre earlier. I don't want to go into real time strategy or point and click or platforming or whatever. I just want to play this. You know what? You do you. Enjoy yourself. If you're having fun, then that's what this industry is about. Having fun. They're games. So enjoy it. Don't shit on other people because they don't like the new Call of Duty. Don't shit on other people because they don't like first-person shooters. Just enjoy what you like. Enjoy, you know, say, hey, look, I'll enjoy this game for this. If you don't enjoy it, great. But I enjoy it and I'm having fun. That's it. But you don't even need to broadcast it. I think social media gave people this this need, this desire to broadcast their lives. I mean, how many people go to restaurants, you see them taking pictures of their food. Look, I'm eating this <laughs> now. I don't care what you're eating. You're, you're obviously alive. And if you're alive, that means you're consuming substance. So you have to be eating. I'm assuming you're eating. I don't need to see it. Unless we're going out to dinner together, then I'll see your food because it's on the table with me. I don't need to see it. It's the same with games. I like when people say, here's what I'm playing. I just beat this. I do it myself. I do it not to, you know, get any type of craziness, but to spark conversation. Oh, I was thinking about that game. What did you think? Oh, yeah, here's what I think. You know, make your own decision. But not to say, oh, yeah, you know, people say, oh, that game sucks. Why'd you play that? Boom. I'm not even going to bother with you because I don't care. And, and that's it. You shouldn't care. People care more about what other people think than themselves. And it's crazy. I, I don't really have that much of an issue of people like post pictures of their food per se, because it's like if you, you know, like, I don't know, I, that, that stuff never bothered me, especially if people cook their own th own stuff. But I can understand. But I can understand your point, though, of like people needing posting for the sake of needing validation which to be fair we all kind of do but it's when you base your entire life around that validation versus just enjoying it as a passer you know what i mean like and i I've, i've found myself guilty of this like if i um like if i put like a, a lot of thought into like a post where I have some like I posted about um I'm getting I mean I'm getting the validation that I seek but I posted earlier today I got pitched like two years ago uh a guest spot to cover uh sex toys tied with video games um one of the wildest <laughs> pitches I've ever been um it was a it was a video game that you could sync your sex toy up to and it's an RPG. So <laughs> it, it was, it was nuts. Um, and I posted about it cause I was hoping to get, you know, people's reaction and that validation. Now where that can get unhealthy is if that ruined my day cause it didn't get enough likes. That's where you have to be careful. And I'd be lying if I wasn't guilty of it. I'd be lying if I, if I said that like, Oh, you know, like, no, I'm, f I, you know, I never do that. No, there'd be times where I'll post and I don't get the likes or whatever that I was hoping for, or some type of feedback that I was hoping for. And then I'm 
bummed out about it. And then I realized like, why am I being depressed over this? This is like, I'm not, this isn't my life. This is just something that I do for fun. So uh, some people find it fun just to post the shit that they like, and they don't get any validation necessarily out of it. They just like to share. And I don't know. That's a, it, and that's, that's fine. You know, I have no problem with that at all. But I know there are other people that absolutely do where they're like, oh, I absolutely need, I need that validation. I need to know that the game I'm playing is great. Like how many people will, will, you know, be excited for a game and then the reviews come out and they're like an eight out of 10 and they go, oh, well, I was expecting a nine. I'm going to pass on it for now. It's not worth it. It's like, it's an eight out of 10. It's still good. Like, what do you, what are you expecting? You know, you could still you could still have fun. I've seen people say like, "Oh, well, it's only twenty hours. That's not worth sixty dollars." That I'm is like, such a weird the, the like the the price uh, whatever the the cost of I forget the term for it. The yeah, I I can't stand that. If a game, no, don't get me wrong. If I'm spending sixty bucks and it's a five hour game, it depends on what the game is. But like, uh. Like, so for example, like Call of Duty, I used to, st- I stopped buying Call of Duties when they were new because I never really played the multiplayer, which is really where you get most of that $60 value from. Um, and I stopped playing it because I just, I only played the single player and the single player was never good enough to warrant a $60 value. Um at least in my opinion, you know, everyone's different. Some people love it. You know, some people, I actually had a friend of mine who said he would spend 20 hours on the campaign because he would literally explore every nook and cranny of that five hour campaign, like every single corner. And that's how he got his enjoyment. And I wish I was a better person at the time. I was like, why were, why are you wasting your time with that? Move on to the next game. But when I should have been more supportive, like if that's what you like doing, you know, that props to you, man. Like if you can find 20 hours of enjoyment out of a five hour campaign, that should be lauded as opposed to me who was just shitting on it at the time. But I was also in my early twenties and you know, you're not always the kindest person in your early twenties. Well, here's what it is. I think when you, again, going back to like growing up as a kid, uh, especially in the 80s and the the 90s, you know, you only got a few games in every couple months or Christmas or birthdays or whatever. So when you're limited to what you have, you make the most of it. You will sit there and you'll you'll beat it and then you'll say, well, I'm going to beat it again on a harder difficulty and you'll master it and you'll do, you know, you go for the cheat codes or you you go for 100 percent or you know, you, you do what you do, you, you squeeze as much enjoyment out of that game because that's, that's all you have until the next set of games come out or you'll, that, at that point you like trade with a friend or something be like, Oh, you play it for a while. Let me play that. Um, that I totally, totally get. And now, you know, I used to do that too growing up. Absolutely. Now I don't like I'll, I hundred percent in Mario wonder because I, I, I did have fun with it. But, you know, Spider-Man 2 is like, it was too much. It was too much to 100%, mm-hmm. you know, all the side stuff. But I, I still did the story. Because there's so many games now that, you know, you can jump right to the next game. You have it at options. I mean, even if, especially if like you're a PC gamer, I mean, how many people did Steam sales and are sitting on like thousands of games that they got for I have dollar? like 400, or not that much. I have like a couple hundred in my Steam library, though, that I've barely played half of them exactly exactly so there's if if right now like right this second someone hit stop on game development forever that's it no more games as of this moment any game that has not been made is never getting made every game that's released is what's released and that's it for the end of time there is not enough time for you or me or anybody else listening to this to play through every game that has been released before you die there's that's not there's too <laughs> many games already yep. released across every system. You will not play through them all. So with that, you know, it's one of those things where if you have a backlog and many gamers do, you know, you might get hooked into a game and say, I'm going to put 150 hours into this game. And there's nothing wrong with that. Enjoy the hell out of it. Or you say, you know what? I put in 15 hours. I had fun. I saw what I wanted to see, or even five hours. I put in what I saw I wanted to see. I got my enjoyment out of it, and I'm ready to move on. There's no reason you should force yourself to keep playing. Move on. 
So if someone takes a five hour game and says, oh, I'm still playing it and I'm going through it and I'm just having fun with it over and over again, that's fantastic because the important thing is they're having fun. And that's what we all should be doing at the end of the day. Do you think that is kind of ties back with like the question I asked before about like the difference, like the best thing about modern games and the worst thing about like the things that modern gamers are missing out on and the type of thing. I feel like sometimes, not all the time, mind you, because we have the luxury of choice now or maybe the burden of choice, depending on how you look at it. But I, f- I wonder if like how much of it is like there's a game where now if, if the game gives you a little bit of, I shouldn't say the slightest bit of pushback, because obviously the Soulsborne games have proven that people do like challenging but fair games. Um, I like I feel like though it's a lot like people bounce off of games, even not even because of difficulty. It like it doesn't spark interest like a crazy amount of interest right away so you just kind of move off on it and i feel like sometimes that is a detriment where if you can push through a section that might not necessarily be the best for you like you don't enjoy all that much and me even if it's a long section and i use the example of red dead 2 um i couldn't stand red dead 2 when i first started it um, I don't know what specifically about it I didn't enjoy, but I didn't enjoy it. And it took me pushing through like the first like four or five hours of the game to finally get my teeth, like sink my teeth into it. And then I became hooked. And now I consider it one of my favorite games of all time. And those first four or five hours that I hated, I actually really enjoy now. So I wonder, I sometimes I wonder if one of the things that we are missing out on is that in a, is because we have so much choice it's a lot easier to make the decision just to move off on a game than to sit with it, try it a little bit longer, push through it. Now, I'm, you know, still silver, you know, like it's a fine line. Don't necessarily torture yourself with a game you despise, but if it's just something that you're, you know, disliking for a little bit, like I I feel like people, and I put, put myself into this category. I feel like people push off of games a little bit too easily now and i if we didn't have as much choice sometimes i wonder if we'd be able to explore games more fully and and learn a little bit more about them you know i 100 percent agree and i'm a hundred percent guilty of it i just did it recently (laughs) uh super bomberman r2 came out big bomberman fan i put the cartridge in booted it up boot up story mode all excited new bomberman adventure and the first thing i have to do is defend these creatures from villains and i noticed one huge huge glare glaring problem in this game is the fact that you could walk through and enemies could walk through your bombs and that was like a staple of bomberman is you would trap yourself and accidentally kill yourself like bombs were immovable objects unless you had like the bomb kick or the bomb throw that was the point of them now you could just walk right through so, like, oh, I better defend. I'm going to put these bombs down. And, oh, the enemies are just walking through the bombs. Like, nothing. And I was like, this is not Bomberman. And then after I succeeded, it was like, oh, now we're entering the ca- I think it was called a castle, where it was like a tower defense. And I just turned the game off. I was like, this is, no, I, I don't, I'm not feeling it. I'm not having fun. This does not feel like the Bomberman I love. And I moved on. And uh, just like that. And... Will I ever go back to it? Probably someday. But it it left such a sour taste in my mouth and there was such an, an option of choice that I moved on. And unfortunately, I moved on to Detective Pikachu Returns, which I did enjoy, but I quit halfway through. And I quit halfway through because it was too easy. And I usually play games on like story difficulty because I want to see the story and enjoy. But what I mean by too diff- uh, too easy is I'm a, I love detective games. I love like Rampa, Phoenix Wright, uh, uh, Mystery Detective Archives, uh, Rain Code just came out, or Master Detective Archives. Mm-hmm. Um, fantastic, fantastic games. And whenever you play those games, you have a mystery. And you're like, oh, it's going to be person A. And by the time the truth is revealed it's person Z and you've gone through all the, Oh, then it's this person. Oh, this change. Like all these evidence, it it keeps you on your toes and excites you. And detective Pikachu returns. It was like, Oh, it's probably this. And it it has to be this, right? Like no way it's this. There's gotta be some spin. And after an hour and a half of gameplay, it's like, Oh no, it's this, it's this. Yep. Exactly. You knew it. You knew it five minutes into the case. And I was like, that's no fun. I'm, I'm now wasting time to get around to the solution that I already know. 
<laughs> that I feel like that's a different story though. When it like, like with with the bomber man example, it's that it completely changed up your your expectation of the gameplay. Whether that's good or bad, you know, maybe you'll come back to it, you know, like in a year or so. And now that you know that it's it's a different type of gameplay mechanic, maybe you'll find some other you know different emergent gameplay or some other type of mechanic. You're like, okay, I understand what they're going for with this now, and now I can enjoy it. Not saying that'll happen, but. Yeah. That le- the, it leaves open the possibility for that versus with Detective Pikachu, it's like this. Is, it's not just like uh, the game didn't like resonate with me at the moment. It was just poor. It, I, I don't want to say poor, like bad because I didn't play it, but like when you specifically for mystery games, I think this is specific to a mystery game, which obviously Detective Pikachu is if you're able to figure out the mystery in the first little bit and the rest of the game continues on like that, then it, it's the same thing in like a movie where like the tension is all gone. If, if the audience already knows what the, the main plot twist is and all the characters in the movie do not, that makes it a, that it's a lot harder for a movie to make itself interesting when the audience knows more than what the characters on screen do. So now you're just waiting for them to figure out shit that you already figured out. And same with Pika, Detective Pikachu. You already know who the villain is, and now you're just waiting for. And it's even almost arguably worse in a game because a game isn't only isn't an hour and a half or two hours. It's well, like a thirty hour experience, and well, you're just me, waiting for them to catch up. Um, I'm talking per case because there's multiple cases. Like the overarching story, uh, I have no idea. But per because there's multiple chapters and there's cases per chapter, and then an overall story that's happening behind the scenes that it's building to. But I never even got to fully experience that part because I was just so turned off by the individual cases. And it's not that it was like I, I knew the answer right away. It was that characters were making dumb decisions despite knowing that. And and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spoil one of the early cases of Detective Pikachu. And, and I'm going to say that because it, it illustrates my point. But. I mean, if you really, really want to play it, you would, I'm sure you would figure this out instantaneously. Uh, and it, it's definitely geared more towards kids in that regard. So I, I plan to go back to it with my son down the road when he's older, um, because I think it'll be a good introductory to mystery style games. But as somebody who plays a lot of them, it's different. So the case is there's a missing item. Okay, someone has this item. Where could it be? Okay, that's a mystery. There's been a robbery, and you're going through the whole nine yards, and then you 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 find out one of the people that put had access to it or potential access to it has a Cramorant, and if you don't know that Pokemon, it is, is a blue bird that swallows things, and you go and find that Cramorant, and he's complaining about a stomach ache. And they talk about how Cramorant you can 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 swallow things and forcibly sp- spit them back up. That's what what Cramorant does in in the Pokemon games, and that you can absolutely do that. You you can make Cramorant do it. So now this Cramorant is oh, I'm full. I've got a really tummy ache. I don't know. And if you have half a brain, you probably have guessed where this item is right now. <laughs> you probably just based on my what I just said, you probably have a good idea. So you would think you're looking for a missing item. This person potentially could have taken it. Their partner Pokemon is a Cramorant who's complaining about stomach aches that you know you can help, by the way, because you could force them to spew up. That's just how the Pokemon works. And they specifically say we can do that, but they don't give you the option to do that. And instead, they tell this poor Cramorant, let's meet back at the place later on after we do another 40 minutes worth of stuff. So this poor (laughs) Cramorant is waddling back to the crime scene in misery because you can actually find him later on. He's halfway back. He's like, oh, I'll get there eventually. Don't worry about me. You know, like this poor guy is like dying just for you to eventually go, oh, yeah, where is it? We have no idea. Oh, it's in the Cramorant, right? Let's check. And it's in the Cramorant. And it's like, I could have saved myself an, over an hour of gameplay. What, let me just Hey, buddy, you have even <laughs> even if it wasn't a mystery, like, dude, you have a stomach ache. Let me at least help you hurl so you feel better. Oh, look, there's the item. Well, what do you know? How did that get there? I don't know. Well, now you have a mystery. How did it get there? That's not the mystery. The mystery is where is the item? <laughs> and it's just like, mm-hmm. come on, I'm. It's there. 
anyway, that's my little rant on on that. But no, no, <laughs> you're good. You're good. Oh, um, I totally, I'm totally lost the thread of how we got to here. In all honesty, talking about quitting games too early. Oh, that's what it was. Thank you. <laughs> it's like, I, I was like listening. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'd be annoyed at that too. How did we get here? Okay. Um, so, oh yeah, quitting games. You're, I, yeah, I, I guess we're both guilty of it though. I, I mean, I, I do it more often than I care to admit um, with like, even what is it recently? I, I started finally playing Splatoon 3, even though I got it for Christmas like a year or two ago or whenever Splatoon 3 came out, played it for like 10 minutes. And I'm like, this is fine. And then I put it down. Granted, part of that was also my kid was awake, so I couldn't really like play, play and like really devote attention to it uh, with a toddler running around. But it still is the fact that I it wasn't captivating me when really I should be taking more time and really getting to know the mechanics of the game before I make that judgment. Um, but in a complete... Uh, hairpin left turn you're gonna com- take a completely different turn on this um you mentioned before with premium edition that you all care about game history so i was more you know it's something i'm passionate about too listeners know i've done full episodes on it so i wanted to dive a little bit into that and kind of how you personally first got in interested in game history like when did you first started getting like noticing like oh this shit's really cool like well, what what can i do to help preserve it that kind of thing so I grew up with video games from the very beginning. I, I was born into a household with an Atari 800 and a Commodore 128. So I loved video games from the get-go. And my uncle uh, was so big into it, he had a software store. Uh, PC, or as we called it then, IBM and IBM compatible. Um, you know, Apple uh, and, you know... Didn't have, it wasn't console, you know, Atari, Commodore. It was, it was more the computer side, the Amiga. Mm-hmm. And uh, just loved games. And I got a lot of my love for him from him. And I never got rid of my games. I kept every game I owned. And I just always just built upon it. And I loved seeing as games change because growing up with, you know, Generation 2, uh, you know, and, and playing Generation 1, and then, you know, into the birth of the NES and, and, and master system into gen three and, and just seeing every generation getting better and better. I really appreciated where it started. And I started to realize, you know, kids stopped caring. Mm-hmm. And I noticed this probably the biggest during the PlayStation Saturn and 64 generation when so many people were introduced to RPGs with Final Fantasy 7. And I was like, yeah, Final Fantasy 7 is okay, but the earlier ones are better. And I, I can't play those. Those those, look, those aren't graphically exciting. Those are, those are 2D. Yeah. Like, yeah, but they're better stories. They're awesome gameplay. You're, you're not going to try them because, of that. yeah, no. And that was only a generation ago. I was like, what the heck? That was the only last generation. Uh, And I started, as it went on, I noticed more and more kids didn't appreciate the older stuff. And and now it it might be a little bit different because of like NSO and and these compilations. But I don't know how, like, if the Mega Man Legacy Collection is selling to newer kids or if it's selling to people like us that grew up with Mega Man that want to replay those games. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know the sales demographic, but as I started getting into collecting more and, and looking at the history and looking at all the forgotten systems. And I realized how many games, especially starting last generation and, and definitely this generation that are released physically or not complete uh, the, the whole DLC. And even when DLC was a thing, a lot of games got game of the year editions that included the DLC on the disc. Yep. And last generation, it was just game of the year edition was the same disc with a code. And I'm like, this is this, so much of this is not preserved. And it was annoying me. Uh, and it annoys other people too. Uh, some good friends that are really die hard in finding the best versions of games and, and stuff. And it's sad that we have to do that. And especially now talking with developers and, and having friends that are developers, uh, I don't want their work to be lost. So one of the things with premium is when we're talking with developers and we, and because we, we release games solely, we will hold off to as much as we can on a release until the game is complete. And that way we can help preserve 
the developer's ideal version of the game uh, for them. And mm-hmm. like our, one of our first games signed uh, was a robot named Fight. And when we signed it, we said, hey, we're, we'd love to launch with this game. And so, well, you know, just so you know, I have some additional content that's free update that's coming out at a later time. And we said, all right, well, let's delay our launch. Then. <laughs> let's delay, delay at least releasing this game until that's done. We want that on the card. Because if we didn't, then that that content would be lost when the servers eventually went down. Yep. So we have continued to include all DLC, whether it be free or paid, or any content patches uh, on each of our releases uh, with the caveat that we can't guarantee that it'll always be complete on cart because if a bug is found, you know, in two years and they patch that one bug, um, you know, we're not going to instantly release the new version of the cart. Um, but, but that's like, like the one little caveat because they, you know, it could happen. It hasn't happened yet, but it could potentially happen. And uh, we've actually had developers make special versions for our physicals or add stuff for our physicals that are exclusive. Um, you know, we, we had like Pigeon Dev Games Collection. The music on the physical is actually different than the digital version. You have two different soundtracks. Uh, you know, some some games have been enhanced for our, the physical mm-hmm. or the physical has spurred the developer to enhance the game so one of our games that's up for pre-order right now lonesome village uh came out great fantastic game and the, because of the physical the developers have actually gone back to the game they're they're working on their third game they went back to it to make sure the switch version was even better than it was at release like touching it up making it a little sharper making it run better because they're so excited about the physical and they want to make sure that the best version of that game is preserved and out mm-hmm. there and i was like that's awesome so that that applies to the digital version too which is great but 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 the physical is what helps spur that and i love that uh you know we have we have some games that you know are coming up down the road that we've been waiting for more content and they're like oh yeah you know like like we'll even include like special early access items that you know are only for early access people like we'll put that on the card we'll preserve those items too you know for you like yes like yeah absolutely we want as complete as complete can be um to preserve it so that if you buy one of our titles you know premium edition games.com uh you you you, uh you get the full (laughs) game you get the the you know games like mighty fight federation have the paid dlc ran your parade the paid dlc is there so you don't have to worry about it and i wish Every company did that. I wish every release did that um, because I, I think a lot of younger people or even people who have, quote unquote, embraced the digital future, if you will, uh, don't care because they're like, oh, by the time the servers go down, I've moved on. And maybe you have. Maybe you will never touch that game again. Great. But if you ever want to share it with your children or your grandchildren, you never will be able to, at least not in its complete form. And that's the way I look at it. Well, I uh, I think that's why I get so riled up about game history and game preservation in general is just because it's you don't know what people are going to care about. Like the the reality of it is, like you could say, like yo, we don't need any of this stuff. But like if you look at like film history and film preservation, like the vast majority of the earliest years of the film industry are lost. Like it, like what is it, eighty ninety percent of it are just gone. Like we'll never get it back. Yeah. Every known copy, at least as of now, has been has has been destroyed or some or lost to time or somewhere, um, for the most part. And games, we don't have that. I mean, granted, it is still pretty damning with what's been going on with, um, like, the Video Game History Foundation released that report a couple months ago. The mm-hmm. house, it was something like 80% 87. of all, 87% of all games are not available on current platforms. 87% is just, it's, it's like, and listen, I get that you can't make every single game available on every single platform, but the thing is, is that, the fact that you can't even buy some of these when they could be available on a platform, uh, it's just, it's, it's wild. And the, the fact that people's go-to response is always like, well, we'll just pirate it. You know, who cares about this? It, like, that's not the point though. Like you shouldn't have to resort to, a, uh, <laughs> activity of dubious intentions illegal activity 
uh, whether you think it's morally right, that's a different story, but you shouldn't have to legally, uh, you shouldn't have to do something illegal just to preserve game history. The fact that game like piracy and ROMs and all that other stuff, which by the way, listeners, I have no issue with just to be clear. I, I, I emulate games as well, but you shouldn't have to rely on p- hobbyists to preserve game history. Like, and the hobbies are doing fantastic work. That's not even to take anything away from them, but that shouldn't be the end all be all. There should be something done. And it's just, it's not, which is why um, companies like premium edition and others and the competitors I will not name uh, do, do what they do. There's, there's uh, they, they try, you guys try to preserve these small indie titles and the, the, Otherwise, would be lost of time. Like how many games disappear off of iPhones and off of app stores every single day without anyone knowing that they're even gone? Uh, who knows if it's you know like just because you don't give two shits about that mobile game or you don't give two shits about you know whatever we wear title after the Wii shop closed down doesn't mean that someone doesn't and doesn't mean that it didn't it could have had a much bigger influence on games than you realize you know stuff like that like there's there's lots of things that I get, you know, I, I get really worked up about. So game history has always, always been something I'm passionate about. Uh, oh, you're a hundred percent right. Uh, absolutely. Uh, what, a game that you may not care about, someone else does, or a game you care about, someone else may not. And the fact that, you know, pirates and emulation is not the answer. It, it is, it is an, an answer, but it, like you said, it shouldn't be the answer. And that's, I love these compilations that they've been putting out and they've been, you know, a lot of game companies are trying to get their back catalogs on there. And, and thankfully we're seeing a lot of backwards compatible systems, which is fantastic to allow those games. But there's also that caveat, for example, um, let's say New Super Mario U Deluxe, right? You got New Super Mario Brothers U and you got New Super Luigi U yep. all together on the Switch. Fantastic. Absolutely. I still think it should have been New Super Mario All-Stars with the other three games, but that's besides the point. You still get those games. But, and here's the but, it's not the Wii U version because the Wii U version had different components like the ability to make the blocks and and to use the gamepad. So while the game is playable on modern consoles and current consoles, it is not the same version as the originally released version, and that version is locked to the Wii U. Both of uh, both games are locked to the Wii U, mm-hmm. and forever will be, or at least potentially forever will be. So while you can play a version of those games, you're not playing the intended original version of those games, and that's that is locked. So that I mean, I'll, I'll be happy if every game is playable at least in some form, but that is that other caveat where it's like, oh, well, this is a, like the 3DS games, like Metopia that came over to uh, the Switch or Sushi Striker came to the Switch. You know, that's that's great that they're there, but they're not the original designed versions. It was designed for the 3DS to use the stereoscopic 3D, to use the features of the 3DS, like the touchpad mm-hmm. uh, in, in those ways. And that's lost. It's it's not the, it's the same game, but it's also not at the same time. So it, it, there's a lot of rabbit holes that you could technically jump through on this topic. I mean, that's, it's it's a lot. That's and that kind of lends to the question of like, what is actually game preservation too? Like, what do what needs to be done in order to preserve a game? And that's what I I I, I steal this a lot from the Game History Foundation, but I think it's it's really a good way to describe game preservation is that there's like three aspects of it, three pillars, physical, digital, and contextual. Um, Like you can buy a game physically. And as you, you were talking about before, Barry, how like just because you buy a game physically doesn't mean you have the game. Like Animal Crossing New Horizons is my go-to example. That game at launch is very different than how it is now extremely yep. different there is so many updates and patches and don't get me wrong i love it but that game isn't necessarily preserved because if the servers go down and you can't update that game you're left with the original one which is fine but there is a lot of changes made to that game um and it's the same with almost every other game and it, so like f- like just because you even have a physical version of a game and the, with the examples you were giving barry how like you know not every version is the same with the, the mario brother the, the mario u and stuff like that like the wii u version is the original and definitive and 
there's stuff that's changed in later releases and shit like that. Like it's, there's so much that goes into it. And that's where the contextual part of preservation really has to come in and play. Cause like, yeah, you can have both versions of that, but you need the context to know that it changed. Otherwise you just think that's the definitive version when it's, it, it's not, you know, and that could be the sure. case for anything. Um, it to also to not even talking about specifically different updates to games, but in terms of the history around games, like uh, I, I bring this example up all the time, but with Animal Crossing New Horizons, if you say you had literally every update possible on a cartridge, say the the the, the type of game in, in there is not an issue that is perfectly preserved, you know, every single update ever is on that cartridge. You will know if, if that's all you have, though you don't know the context of how much animal crossing new horizons meant to people during the pandemic and how it connected people for an entire, like two to three years like that, like for two years, like 2020 and 2021, it was one of the largest games of, on, of all time. Like there's so many, especially in 2020. Um, Mm -hmm. I I mean, I'll even go back to Pokemon go in the summer of 2016 where yeah, Pokemon go is still popular now, but you had to be there in the summer of 2016 where all of a sudden it was like parks were packed because every person on and their mother was playing Pokemon go and walking around their neighborhood and exploring different places and how it like brought up business for local businesses and it, and it helped them make some extra money that they might not have had beforehand because now there's more people stopping there for Pokemon. I mean, local business advertised their place as Pokestops like that. It was a thing. And it, that's where that's why i get so like worked up over game history because there there's it's a lot more than just like it means a lot more than just oh i can play this game in 20 years that is a huge part of it but there's so many more elements to it like how like the people who study film the people who study literature like you need to study the classics so you can uh i shouldn't say you need to it's good though to study the classics in any medium in order to advance the medium even further to see where it's been so you can figure out where it needs to go next um and if we don't preserve games you you lose that well it's one of those funny things you mentioned because if you look at like an emulation list, like you got like, oh, I got a series of ROMs, you know, I'm going to go play Mario 3. You're probably going to see like multiple versions in a ROM list yeah. because they revised the game without telling anybody and you just got Mario 3 on the NES. You didn't know what version you had. Um, and the slight, very slight changes, you, uh, you really didn't experience that. You just played Mario 3. And it wasn't until games were dumped that we're like, oh, there were versions of this. Well, fun fact, that's still the case with modern kind games, especially Nintendo. What I mean by that is Nintendo will re-release games, like a second printing or a third printing, with all updates. They just don't reprint the same cartridge. So, for example, if you got Mario Tennis Aces on the Switch when it launched, you got a great game. It was fun, you know? Maybe it could use a little more content, but still fun. But then for over a year, they would add new tennis players, new characters to play as. They were free. They would just added those characters. It was like 12 characters or something, or 14 characters were added. A huge chunk to the roster. But if you still have that initial cartridge and the servers go down, you could still play the game just fine, but you don't have that added content. But they did reprint the game and you can get a copy of the game with all those characters that were free on the cartridge. So when the servers go down, those characters are still there, but only if you have the right cartridge. So it is happening. Animal Crossing, you can get a cartridge with a more updated uh, content on it. Huh. You may not have the newest one, but you can. So they have been actually preserving a lot of that, just not making a big deal about it. You have to find the right revision on the cartridge. Um, but yeah. So I did not know that <laughs> this is a thing. This is where the rabbit hole just keeps going down. In, uh, in your opinion or like, what's something that you would like to see done more in game preservation? I'd like to see a, a bigger push for physical preservation mm-hmm. because digital preservation is nice, but and I, digital preservation is fine too. Don't get me wrong, but, but it has to be both that, but the thing is with digital Digital is tied to a server or it's tied to an account. It's tied to things that can go away. 
uh, that can, you know, a company goes under, they don't want to pay for it. Look, we've seen Nintendo shut down the 3DS and the Wii and the Wii U eShops. You know, mm-hmm. Sony did the PS3. Uh, or no, they did the PSP and they were threatened the PS3 and the Vita and people barked at them. So they're still up right now, but they they probably won't be for much longer. Um, this is how Microsoft is, is killing theirs as well, or they did kill some of their older stuff. Uh, I think 360 is knocked out now. So I would prefer physical preservation for that very reason, because it's it's not tied to an account. You you know, anyone can enjoy it. You can lend it to somebody. You can just play and I'd love to see games, every game if possible, preserved in some way. Do I think that's ever going to happen? No. And here's it's not why. necessarily even realistically feasible with like, you know. You no, know, it's feasible. It just takes people to care. And the reason for that, when I, the reason why I said that is game, game, physical game production is expensive especially like on the switch where cartridges are more expensive than discs. And that's the reason you see so many physical games where it requires a big download where it has, Oh, just a little bit. They get the smallest card to have a physical in quotes, but it requires a download for the rest Um, because they're, they're not being, they're not, they're not being smart about it in, in the preservation sense. They're being smart about it in the profit sense. Yeah. They can make more profit if they buy the cheaper card as opposed to buying the more expensive card and getting the whole game physically preserved because they don't care. Um, they have their own service. And even then there's source code that's lost. Like Panzer Dragoon Saga on the Saturn, the source code is lost. Okami, when that game came out in the PS2, Clover Studios lost the code. I don't know how, but they lost it. So when Okami came for the Wii, they had to rebuild that game from the ground up to get it on the Wii. Kingdom which Hearts is... HD, same story. Yep. So when you have things like that, like if you're losing source code, then that shows you that digital preservation is not foolproof. It's an option and it should be an option, but physical preservation is foolproof. And the reason I say that is because if you print 10,000 discs, you know, and have the ability to print more, that would only that game would only die if all ten thousand discs magically exploded, <laughs> like like they all got destroyed. Like the reason Panzer Dragoon Saga is expensive is because there's so few copies out there, but people can still play that game because it exists. Um, you know, and I've saw one person counter what I just said with about physical, saying, "Oh, well, then if you have physical, what happens when your 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 Blu-ray drive dies?" And, and my answer to that is simple: there's a billion Blu-ray drives. <laughs> and there's like always going everywhere. to be someone who's like a like a independent like tinkerer or whatever you want to call it um who finds solutions in the future i i i think ideally a good combination of the two in my personal opinion because like you want to you want both that's the reality of it you mm-hmm. you never want one or the other because all physical eventually shit deteriorates you know like as much as I love my NES cards, eventually they're going to deteriorate. Uh, discs get data rot, you know, shit like that. Uh, so old, you, only older discs, like Blu-rays, it's really hard to damage Blu-rays. Oh yeah, yeah, and I mean, I but like PS One, would you, PS One, did they get data rot? PS One, Saturn, like the early Sega CD, yeah. Jaguar CD, like the and early I, CDs. And even then, they're gonna like if you treat them well, they're gonna last a while. Data rot takes a while, but you still need physical preservation or digital preservation for something so you can make new copies if shit gets lost. With that said, you need backups of those digitals. Otherwise, you run into the situations like we mentioned with Square Enix and with Clover? Yeah, Clover. Clover, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, You need backups for that shit. But we do have to start wrapping this up. I know you said you didn't want to go too much past uh, 10, and we are already past 10. Um, I'm not (laughs) surprised. conversation. Yeah, I've, I've been enjoying this, man. And I, I'm happy that because I, listeners, I had mostly planned to ask about premium edition stuff, which don't get me wrong. I want you to promote because you are giving me your time and I want to make sure that you can promote the, some of the stuff that you're working on. But at the same time, I didn't want it to just be a full hour long conversation about uh, just I don't know, like almost like an advertisement, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm, I'm real. I really enjoyed this conversation. Talk about your, your thoughts on game history and, uh, like gaming in general, you know, modern to now. Um, so dude, thank you so much for joining me. This has been a lot of fun. 
Thank you so much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. So before we wrap all this up, where can my good listeners find you and what would you like to promote? What social media is all that good stuff? Shout it all out. Here's your, here's your platform for it. Sure. So if you would like to follow me on Twitter, Blue Sky or Fuse uh, or Discord even, you can find me at Hawk Hellfire. Um, send me a message. Love to talk video games. Uh, you know, just love to be part of the community. Uh, for Nintendo Fuse, you can find us at NintendoFuse.com and you can find us on YouTube.com slash Nintendo Fuse uh, every other Monday night at 8.30 p.m. Eastern. You can find us live on the podcast. You can find us on Twitter and all other social media platforms at Nintendo Fuse. And for Premium Edition Games, you can find us at PremiumEditionGames.com, where right now you could pre-order all of our Series 7 titles. That includes Anuchard, Lonesome Village, and the Fantastic Sunshine Anthology, as well as some of our NES games like Oratorio. Uh, On top of that, we have an entire list of games that are in stock right now um, that are not part of the pre-order programs of our previous series that you can absolutely pick up and play, like the Pigeon Dev Games Collection, Mighty Fight Federation, Wonderling DX, Rain in Your Parade, Rack and Ruin, and a bunch more. So definitely give uh, a check out to those. Uh, They're they're all great games. Uh, You can find us on social media Twitter Premium Edition One, that's numerically one. Everywhere else, Premium Edition Games, uh, both Nintendo Views and Premium Edition have a Discord, so feel free to join those, and uh, you'll find me in, in each of those. And uh, yeah, just thank you so much for uh, for your time and listening, and I hope you enjoyed this conversation. <laughs> I I definitely did, so I hope they did as well. Um... As usual for myself, you can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at StillLoadingPod on all of them. If you want to email me, you can email me StillLoadingContact at gmail.com. If you want to support the show, you can do so in a number of ways. Please give it a five-star rating or review on whichever podcasting app or service you use because it helps me feel warm and fuzzy, and I like feeling warm and fuzzy. Um, you can also support the show monetarily for uh, at, over at Patreon.com slash StillLoadingPod for a dollar a month. You'll get, a f- you'll get all the episodes of few days earlier with better audio quality as well as access to patron voting rights which helps guide the direction of the show if you want to help pick future topics you can do that for as little as a dollar a month um at the four dollar level you get everything i mentioned at the one dollar level plus access to two mini bonus episodes every month uh that covers a variety of topics you know uh, sometimes they're music episodes like SNES selections or Genesis jams or just kind of little music episodes, just highlighting some of my favorite tracks on the systems. Um, also, I've been doing this series on the Gamer 5 portable system, which is one of those wonderful handhelds that features 220 games in one, you know, all of totally great quality you know like if you ever wanted to play curly monkey and its sequel curly monkey 2 this is this is the series for you to find out all about that um and then uh, the last tier that i have is the five dollar level which is everything i mentioned prior at the one and four dollar levels plus access to still bonding which is my monthly james bond podcast where me and a bunch of friends bond over 007 those episodes are two and a half to three and a half hours long and we are all the way up to the timothy dalton era by the time you're hearing this so there is a lot of content for you for five dollars so please go consider checking that out patreon.com slash still loading pod and of course i want to shout out my friends over at the bit by bit foundation the bit by bit foundation is is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to put video games and video game consoles in the hands of kids receiving inpatient care at hospitals. So if you want to support them, go to bitbybitfoundation.org and consider donating. And that is all the time I have for you on this episode of Still Loading. Barry, thank you once again for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a blast. And with all that said, listeners, I will see you all next time. <laughs>